I'll say continue. All right, so everyone hit the got it because we're getting this session recorded. So on the board is the agenda and some housekeeping things that I'd like to you know, uh, go through real quick. If you can see those items, the first thing there is the RTC scholarship workshop. And then the recommendation speaks to that I will write you a recommendation as it relates to the scholarship. Now it's an online application process and I'll conduct the workshop exclusive for our construction management program. So you don't have to have a person outside of our program come in and share with you. There are plenty of instructional videos related to putting together the scholarship and there's some live workshops that you can certainly attend that I can give you that information, the dates, if you want to attend something in person. But this um, workshop exclusive that I'll go through and show you how to do the application, we'll do that next Monday, okay? So come to the 101 class and we'll do that. We'll get through the class first and then stick around and I'll take about 30 minutes and we'll go through the application process online and you can follow me and I'll even record it. So if you can't make the session, I'll have it on a recording that you can watch it at another time and see how you get into the application and put it together. The application is going to be due on October 31, which seems to be a, a day that we all are knowing to be Halloween. So that will be due at the stroke of midnight on Halloween, your application. But I don't want you to work on it on 31st and expect for me to get you a recommendation that's not gonna happen. You need to let me know at least in a week in advance. So by October 24, you need to know, let me know that you're going to be putting together an application <clears throat> and have sent me an invite uh, to put that recommendation together. Because if I get something after the 24th, I'm gonna be honest with everybody, is I just don't have time with everything that's going on right now with the program and doing a lot of extracurricular things as it relates to accreditation and then getting to you to primarily, which is my job, is to you know, teach and work with you on construction management, that uh, it's going to be really hard for me to find that time. And I, I certainly don't want to be up uh, at the wee hours of the night because I do need to get some rest just like you guys. And so make sure that this is the due date, but that you get me something of your interest by the 24th so I have enough time to put together your recommendation, okay? So today is, what, October 12th? Yeah, October 12th. So got some time to think about it. Uh, like I said, next Monday, which is going to be, what, today's Wednesday, 13, 14, 17th, October 17th, that night, it, during the 101 class, come and we'll we'll do it. We'll go through and I'll, I'll do the application live and then I also tape record it as well. Okay, so that's the RTC scholarship. Um, so here's some dates to mark. And these are really important dates. And everything that, that I share as it relates to the program, I strongly encourage, strongly recommend. Uh, nothing is absolute, nothing's required. Uh, it really is, you know, intentional on your end to, to want to participate and be involved. But I strongly encourage it and strongly recommend it. Uh, and a lot of, lot of that is a result of the industry and what the industry tells me as an instructor to you as future construction managers is getting construction experience. And experience can be in the office, working with estimators or working with project managers, working, seeing how a construction office works if you're working for a construction organization or in the office learning management techniques on how to organize and you know write forms of that relate to construction those types of things it's fantastic that's awesome experience but also too a big part of construction is learning how all the pieces fit together you know i look at it as if you were to open up a box of legos and you put a lego together right you're actually putting the parts and the pieces together and figuring it out using the instructions. It's kind of the same idea. When we get out in the field, it'd be nice to have an experience where you can kind of see all the parts and pieces fit together. So we have a couple people that have graduated from the construction management program here at RTC that work as superintendents for Habitat for Humanity. 
They have a project in North Bend that they're working on. And on these particular dates, uh, if you can see that, yeah, you can see that. So November 12th, November 19th, and November 3rd, they are Saturdays, okay? And I'm going to be on those Saturdays, the plan right now, because plans can change, but the plan right now is I'm going to be here on campus those Saturday mornings, probably around eight o'clock, and I'm going to drive to North Bend and volunteer to help with the project that they're working on, which is um, a, a, a residential complex, but it's just not a residence. It's um, kind of like apartments, condos mix, but it's a really nice project. And they're at a stage on the project where they're doing interior work, like hanging doors and putting up drywall and doing some painting and doing some finish work and maybe some cabinetry. I'm not quite sure exactly what would be the scope of what is the interiors work, but I can tell you as it relates to Construction 160 and what we're gonna be studying around this time in November is we're gonna be studying interiors type work and if we're have the chance to actually go out and be involved as a volunteer to help with those types of uh, scopes of work, uh, what a great learning experience. So mark these dates and you don't have to meet me here in the morning. Yeah, I can give you the location of the project in North Bend. Yes, it's a little bit of a drive, but not too far. And meet everybody there and we'll be able to meet the, the, gra the graduates or graduate whoever's gonna be there running the job, they, mo they both might be there working on the project, that they know we would be coming would be exciting for them and they would be able to make sure that we're taken care of. Now, this just isn't a field trip where you're walking around observing. This is an actual opportunity to volunteer your time to actually contribute and do some construction work. And they would never put you in a position of doing work that you don't want to do, right? So if it's something that you don't wanna do, you don't have to do it. No one's forcing you to do it. If it's something you just wanna kind of come out, maybe do a little bit, but then observe the rest, that's entirely fine too. No one's judgmental. No one's going to judge or, or look to put any pressure on you to have to do work. I just think this is a great opportunity that we have a relationship with Habitat for Humanity that you know we can do some great things for Habitat and at the same time learn a little bit about interior work as it relates to construction. So that's what's going on. And I want to make sure that you mark those dates. But again, today's the 12th. So, you know, 30 days advance notice. I'm hoping that you'll be able to maybe block out half your day on Saturday, or if you want to do a full day, which is what my intention is, is to put in a full eight hour day to help them. Uh, you can be there for the full eight hours. Now, in that effort, if you do that, certainly I'll negotiate with you and maybe look at it as a possibility for some extra credit. So if there's, if there's, work that you felt you didn't do well early in the quarter and you'd like to use some makeup for it, I'll certainly work with you on that. And we can ensure that there's some value that can be, um, op that, that can be applied to the course. The thing about these types of field trips is that the opportunity is there to take photographs, to be you know, detailed in the work that we do. Uh, these are things that could be artifacts as I talked and you can see in the syllabus, I talk about a scrapbook that we can put together a scrapbook and it may be able to share photographs and features and work that you did on a project that as a portfolio that's built digitally might be something that you might be able to reference during the course of looking for work or in, in the opportunity to share, let's say in an interview. So the scrapbook is something that we can build over time as you're here in the program. And if we have opportunities to actually get in the field and get pictures and snapshots of you actually doing work, I can't think of anything better to share with somebody in an interview. Okay, so there's great value to this Habitat for Humanity. Again, it's entirely volunteer because that's what Habitat for Humanity is all about, but a great opportunity for learning and construction and getting out in the field. And it's very safe and it's no cost and it's just the day. And at the end of the day, you feel good about yourself because you volunteered and you helped for a good cause. All right, that being said, uh, we have a career fair coming up on November 2nd. And that's here on campus from three to 6 p.m. at the RTC cafeteria. Now, um, I, I think that this is a great opportunity for you to get a feel of the type of companies that are out there looking for uh, construction project managers, construction project engineers, um, entry level, 
there are a lot of construction industry companies, whether they're general contractors who build for uh, a living or whether they're subcontractors like plumbing contractors or electrical or mechanical, which work on air conditioning. There are painting companies, drywall company. I mean, all of the different types of specialty contracting companies, as well as construction companies, i.e. general contractors will be there. And they want to meet you. Believe it or not, yes, they want to meet. Now, if you're shy or you're like you're already dismissing yourself that like the scholarship, oh, I can't get a scholarship, I'm not worthy, or oh, I can't get a job with a good construction company, but I'm not worthy. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody, but that's, I want to say bull, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to offend anybody. It's bull crap, okay? All that is bull crap. You can't tell me that you aren't capable of working for any of these companies, all right? So even if you go to the career event and you're not looking for work, it's good to get the vibe of the industry because that's what's going to be there is, is you're going to get a feel for what type of companies are out there and who they're looking for to hire. And you know what? You just never know. You might find and you might attach yourself to a company that's really interesting, have a great conversation. And the next thing you know, they're interested in you, right? And there's nothing greater than having companies interested in you and your services. Now. I went to an industry event last night and many people who are at that industry event are going to be at the career fair. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, we want to get into the career fair. How can you help us, Jeff? Uh, and they're a construction company or they're a subcontracting company. I'm like, and this is the first time that really I've never been to an industry event where people have co actually come to me. There's such a demand and a need for construction managers that going to these types of events will will we'll allow you to gain those conversations and, and to see if this is the right choice, right? Is this the thing that you want to do? And I think that you'll find that it, it should be. It should it, You will find that. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to mark this on your calendar. What I found in the past is law students just don't take advantage of it. Um, you're here and you're here to create gain skills, uh, and really valuable skills, quite frankly, to companies that will look to hire you and to use those valuable skills you're learning in the industry. And in time, you will make a good living. You will be making a very good living. And so I so, so hope that you're able to come to this event and I'll be there. The other thing that I will tell you is that as I get an idea, people come to me in confidence, RSVP with me and say, hey, I think I'm gonna go to the fair or um, can you tell me more about it? Uh, we'll prep, right? We'll we'll have a quick workshop before we go to the fair. We'll prep it out because I'm going to know everybody there. So if you're coming, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. So I mean, this is this is ready made for success and for adventure and for exploration in a career of construction management. Um, okay. So keep that in mind. I'll continue to remind you about the career fair, but you need to be marking these items on your calendar. These are great opportunities to learn and great opportunities to get involved with the industry. And um, you know, for those of you who are locked in, this is what you wanna do, even the better. For those of you who are still not quite sure, but you're pretty sure that this is what you wanna do, the more so to come in and to get involved and to meet people in the industry. Um, I quite frankly, am surprised at the amount of people that came to me last night. Um, I don't think it's so much that they're looking for people to work, which is probably the main reason why they came to me, but they also, are finding out and hearing from people within their companies about the RTC program, which makes me feel good because, you know, I've been here, well, it'll be my eighth year. So maybe all of those students who graduated in the past are making inroads and being successful. And they're sharing that with other people who might look at their success and say, hey, you know, did you go to school or something? And they might be saying, yeah, I went to RTC and they have a construction management program there. Go talk to Jeff. And then they come talk to me and then I see you right? Then you're here sitting down in front of me or in front of your computer at home and getting, I'm getting all excited about the career floor. So make sure that you put that on your uh, docket, okay? Make sure you get that going. And I'll continue to remind me as we get there. All right. So now a little bit more about um, schoolwork. And unfortunately, I mean, I, because of all of the slow bandwidth and everything, um, you know, we might have to take a break and I'll see if I can get something up. Uh, but I do want to do some fun things here, probably in about 15, 20 minutes. But before we do that, um, I, I want to 
talk to everybody and see if they have any questions. I'm just going to quickly review what we've talked about the last couple of weeks. I know some of you have been diving into the homework and getting into completing those items that are in the workbook and do the workbook and do the best that you can. If you've got questions on anything, put a little question mark next to it and reach out to me and uh, you know, try and do my best to try and answer the question for you. But just in, in quick review, right? We talked about soils, uh, varying capacity in the foundation and intermixed in there was a little bit about drainage and some detailing in there about kind of how those materials kind of related to each other. I had you draw it out and I'm still working on getting it, you, your feedback and getting you uh, your assignments completed there uh, therein. So the idea of the soils varying capacity in the foundation certainly is their materials that we work with and that they have relationships. And when we talk about soils and varying capacity, right, we talked about the foundation, how the foundation then kind of is the tr transitory component part piece that allows the weight of the building to transfer through the foundation into the soils. And you had an assignment, 2.2, which basically I have you watch me solve the problem and then have you just model, emulate, do exactly what I did in the video uh, to complete the exercise in the workbook. And so I, whether it made sense to you or not, really, I'm not trying to teach you to be an engineer. What I want you to be thinking about are relationships, right? Relationships between the weight that the, that the, that the case or that the story problem speaks to because it's a fairly typical case and how that situation relates to the foundation and how that foundation then carries into the soil and how we look at all these different methods or these materials and how the method of how we have buildings set on the earth, on the soil, how it all relates. And so that's kind of the idea that I wanted to take from the videos as you watch them and just basically model and complete the exercise that way, all right? Um, and that was 2.2. If any of you do have any questions or want, to um, talk a little bit further about that because you want to know a little bit more about it or, or get a little bit deeper into it, then let me know. I'll do a sidebar or I'll do a little maybe short uh, snippet of a video that might speak to that question. So if you have something, go ahead and send it to me, either in a Canvas inbox or a text message or something, and, uh, and I'll respond and get back to you. And if I get a number of students that are kind of asking the same type of question, then definitely I'll put something together in terms of video snippet and you can be able to watch it and, 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 and learn a little bit more. Um, but as we're talking right now, 2.2, um, watching the video and basically emulating, modeling and completing the, pro, the, the, the problem as shared, does it, does it make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? Everyone doing okay? Somebody needs in. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Yeah, I'm just racing this. It's on video, so you guys can watch it again. But I'm just racing this because I want to erase what I've already talked about. Okay, so 2.2 is workbook. So make sure you get that done. Um, watch that video, complete the problem as I shared. And if it still is not making sense or it's confusing, give me that feedback. And I will get back with you either personally or if I get more than one uh, person giving me feedback, I'll try and put something together that will kind of be a follow-up, if you will, to that assignment. All right, so the next thing then that we were speaking and talking about was recently wood. And I believe in your uh, homework uh, within the module, there were some things to do. And I recently, within the week, put in a video that I found on YouTube that had the fella go through and kind of you know, quarter saw, plane saw, kind of cut things out, if you will, looking at the, the log. And I think that's really important to understand the cut of the log and how, and to how, as you see material, right? When you see the material that's cut, where and kind of locating it, if you will, where in the log, and to some extent, you might even be able to tell 
you know, if it's from plain sawn or quarter sawn. And the reason why is looking at, you know, the, uh, the um, I'm not sure what the correct term is, but when you look at, you know, the log, there's the grain, but then there's all the circles, right? Uh, the radial circles that give, you know, basically the age of the, of the, of the tree. But, but the way that the tree grows, right, creates that kind of those, those circles and how those circles are cut gives you kind of an idea of how that wood will perform in a construction application. And one of the assignments, I think it's not sure which one, 3.1 or 3.2, or might be 3.1. The second half of 3.1 has uh, questions that might have been confusing to you that go, uh, have you, uh, and I believe I tried to clear this in the assignment, have you go to a few tables in the textbook that talks about how wood will change in its shape based on moisture content, right? As it loses moisture, it behaves, it shrinks as it gains moisture, right? It'll expand. And though very subtle, can't be seen, as wood changes its behavior, let's say in a structural structural method, if you will, or, or how we build buildings, that one particular uh, section in 3.1 spoke to what would be the change, right? In the height, I believe, of the, of the uh, section of construction that it shared uh, based on how this material was used and how you would look at and, and figure out not only the grain, but the, its expansion and contraction, if you will, due to the moisture. And so there are a couple of tables that you had to kind of go through and work on. And I have to, I, I wanna say that I did a video that shows the solution that I'll get posted for you, that you'll be able to see how that comes about and how that's resolved. And you can check what your solution is against what is the video solution. So I'll have that posted so you can see how that works and make any changes if there's adjustments to that assignment or uh, find out that, hey, you know, I think I read the table right. I think I was on the right path here because it's not an easy workbook assignment because you have to go to the textbook and you have to refer to a couple tables and to some, to some extent be able to read the information that's coming out of the textbook and, and do a little bit of analysis there. Hey, and Jeff. that's in 3.1. Um, I've got- Do my, you know where that table is? Uh, it should tell you in the assignment. I'm pulling the workbook here right now. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I haven't been able to find anyone that got those, and I couldn't find the table anywhere. So it says here um, it's a platform frame in 5.2, and it doesn't in the assignment it doesn't look like it tells you to refer to the table, but I believe um, I can tell you what tables they are. Just one second here. And um, I, the one thing I'm not able to pull up is Canvas. That was part of the problem here earlier tonight was un, unable to, to pull up the Canvas to, to be able to. What's, what, what's that? I have my nose pulled up if you want. Oh, that, that's okay. I'm just, um, I might be able just to tell everybody what the tables are that are relevant to the assignment. Let me just see here. If, um, let's see. So table, um, let's see. I think uh, page 89 of the textbook, figure 3.12 which is a table uh, that along the y axis is a shrinkage uh, percent of a green dimension of wood. And then there's some moisture content along the x axis. You'll see kind of a curve that says tangential and radial. And that table, I believe, is a table that's used. And I think I thought there was another table, but I could be wrong. That might be the limitation of what the table is there. I think it might be just that table. Again, that would be figure 3.12 on page 89. And then you look at that table 
and I don't, I've got the, I'm pulling the problem here in front of me right now, 3.1, and it would be uh, question six on page 26 of your workbook of 3.1, uh, parts A and there's parts B. And it says here- And, part, and question number five is also confusing. Oh, does that include, question number five is like that as well? Yeah, it asks how big the, how much the shrinkage would be would be if it was 12% and it doesn't like give you a, a, an equation to figure that out. Right, you, that's the table. We have to look at that table. Figure 3.12. So we're looking at table 3.12, I'll write it up here. So for, for this workbook problem, go to the figure 3.12. So figure 3.12, that's on page 89 of the textbook. And this is, this is an, a nice assignment and a, a good opportunity to study tables. Many times, you know, when we are given assignments or reading the textbook, uh, we're all kind of focused on just, you know, studying and looking at the text. One study strategy that I strongly recommend is that, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the courses that I teach, is there's a lot of reading. And, you know, particularly, I'm not a big reader, so I don't like to read. And who really wants to, you know, so... Don't read, look at the tables. And then ask yourself, what do these tables mean? What are they communicating? And in this particular case, when you look at table and figure 3.12, shrinkage of a typical softwood with decreasing moisture content. So let's just think about that for a second. If you got a sponge and it's full of water, right? It's pretty heavy. It's probably a little bit more expansive. If you take that sponge and you squeeze it, what happens to the water? It goes away, right? And what with the sponge is much lighter, there's less moisture. And likely the sponge just looks just as you and I look at it, same size. But I mean, if we're looking at it maybe in the con in the context of wood, let's say, that at a micro level, even though our eyes can't see it, it has actually shrunk, right? It's actually gotten smaller. So when you look at moisture content in wood and as that moisture evaporates or leaves the wood, right, the wood's gonna shrink. So when you look at a table like this, you've got moisture content at the lower half of the table and up on the left-hand side, you've got uh, the shrinkage, uh, which is of a percent. So when we look at the question, a board exactly 12 inches wide was quarter sawn from a green softwood log then seasoned to a moisture content of 12%. Says, how wide is it now? Show a calculations. So if it was exactly 12% and then it was seasoned to a moisture content of 12%. So when we look at the moisture content, I, the first thing I look at is the table and I go to uh, a seasoned moisture content of 12%. And then I think part of the clues in the question are going to be quarter sawn. So when something's quarter sawn, right, we will have an idea of the grain of that wood when it's quarter sawn. So when you look at, let's say, go back to the prior page in 87 and look at quarter sawn, and you see in the quarter sawn that the 12 inch piece was cut as you can see there, right? And so look at the grain of the wood. The grain of the wood is almost running, if you will, parallel to the top and bottom edges. So it's not running vertical, it's running parallel. So your quarter sawn is going to shrink and it's asking uh, the, how, what, the, what will happen to the width of it, right? So the width of it's gonna obviously get smaller then the question comes looking at the table. If I'm at 12% and I roll up my table and I'm looking at the, the on the left-hand side, it's the shrinkage percentage. There's the radial and then there's the tangential, right? So radial, where, if the radial is gonna shrink, is it gonna shrink 
from which direction. So we have to determine tangential or radial. The radial, if we look at the cut of the wood, so let me see here, I'll try and draw it up on the board here. If we look at the cut of this wood, so I'm looking at quarter sawn here. So I'm gonna take this piece right here is our 12 inch. And this is the way that the grain is gonna be, right? So this is 12 inches. And my grain's gonna be running like this. Now I'm, you know, the grain might have a small radial to it, but that's the idea. So if we look at the table, we find 12% and we see the radial curve. What is the shrinkage? What does the shrinkage look like? Well, read the table. Starting at the bottom and going up, I'm at 12%, there's 1%, there's 2%, there's 3%, but I hit radial right at about what? Two and a quarter? Is there two and a half or a little bit over two and a half. Right, so what's important for me is that you're reading the table and you're reading it right. Fine tuning it and getting it to the exact measure is, is important certainly, but the importance is how you're reading the table. So if the radial shrinkage, right, is two and a half or two and three quarters, then, and you look at, you've got 12 inches here, right? This also could be looked at this way, right? I'm laying it flat. This could be 12 inches here. But if we have a shrinkage and we're using the radial curve, would we say, Two, two and a half, two and a half to two and a quarter, maybe something like that. Um, as far oh, that's percent now, that's percent. Sorry. So two point five to two point seven five percent shrinkage. So then, if this were the shrinkage, then it would just be a percent of this. So this is going to be less than twelve inches by this amount. Right, so if something shrink, if something is twelve inches and it shrinks one percent, you would take twelve inches and multiply it point by point zero one. So twelve inches times zero point zero two five, because that's the equivalent of two and a half percent. What is that value? Twelve inches times zero point zero two five. 0.3. So, so that this is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, so 0 0.3, it 0 0.3 is um, what? Th what is that? Five sixteenths of an inch. Five, yeah. So then, that twelve inches would shrink to five five sixteenths, right? So that if that's five sixteenths of an inch. Then twelve inches less five sixteenths is going to be your new width. Or 11 and 11 sixteenths. So 11, 11 sixteenths. That makes sense? You just solved it. Does everyone see how that, how that worked? Now that's the radial. If you look at the tangential, right? So tangential would be this right? This distance. So if this was, let's just say, I'm just saying, and I'm making up a problem now because that's not what the problem was asking. But if this is a two by, then this is one and one half inches or 1.5 inches. So looking at ten tangential going up 12%, it looks to be about what? Three and a, three and a quarter? Mm -hmm. So we would do the yeah, same three and, and a half, three and a half, the three and a half percent times. So like here, I'm, I don't know. I'm just thinking I'm going through the same, and this makes sense to me. I'm going through the same motion. We're looking at this thickness here of one and a half percent, but this is tangential. So we go to the tangential curve on the table and we multiply that 
would we say? Zero point well, 12 inches. What is it? What, what's it? Would we say three to three and a, three and a half? Oh, three and a half. So it'd be point zero three five. And that's 1.5. Make it 11 and 9 sixteenths. So you got a minus 9 sixteenths? 7 sixteenths. 7 sixteenths. So this becomes 11 sixteenths. With no, the 7 sixteenths. 7 sixteenths. Yes. Okay. What did, what did this end up being? I'm just, what does this end up being? 1.5 times 0 0.035. What's that? Where'd you get the 1.5? What was that? 1.5 times 0 0.35, is that right? What, uh, 1.5, 0 0.035. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. All right, so this is the shrink, right? This is the, the, the shrinkage. And so we just subtract that from the one and a half. Which is a 16th of an inch. 16th of an inch. And then for the 12 inch length, we just took this value, 0 0.30 inches, which we said, what was it again for this? Uh, 7 16ths. 7 16ths, and we subtracted that from the 12 inches. So this. And this was less, would we say 16th? Yeah, it's a 16th of an inch. Right. So we're losing a 16th of an inch here based on the story problem of uh, seasons to a moisture content of 12%. And then, and then the width, we're losing 7 16ths. So that's that that problem and how we utilize that table. Okay, so this is on video, so you'll be able to come back and, and see it again. So now the other one is the um, the platform frame, and I believe it has. Let's see, um, figure 5.2. And that's going to be going to chapter to chapter five, because it's figure 5.2. And so that's on page 153. And I'm not going to drop that entire diagram there, but still the same idea. When you look at the platform frame, which is on the left-hand side of the uh, of the picture that's depicted, it's the platform framing on the left. And the question, reading it out loud, the platform frame shown in Figure 5.2 of the text contains a total of 33 inches of cross-grain wood between foundation and roof or the following show the calculations. So when you look at the platform frame, you're going to see where you see, and I don't have it up here and I can't really draw it all that accurately, but you'll see based on our plan reading, and for those of you in construction, you're familiar, but you'll see in that platform frame, the sections of the two by material that are identified with an X, okay? So you'll see at the very top, you see this type of depiction, right, X. So you'll see a couple of them stacked on each other. Then you go down and then there's another one by itself, another X. So you see, I think you're gonna see one, two, three, four, five, six, that look like this. And I think you're gonna see a couple that look something like this, a little bit more like this. And so when we look at these cuts of material, if we think about, and let's see, the, the, 
problem tells us the platform frame shown in the 5.2 of the text contains a total of 33 inches of cross grain wood between foundation and roof for the following show calculations. So when they say cross grain, when they say cross grain, that's just another term that encompasses the quarter saw and the plane saw, right? So cross grain, this is cross grain, whether you're quarter saw in here or whether you're cross grain cutting here, right? That's, you know, a, a cross grain cut. So when you see those X's, those are cross grain. So with cross grain, we have quarter saw and we have plane saw. Now they just say cross grain here at the top, but then the A it says, assuming that the plane saw framing lumber shrinks. Okay, so there's a clue right there, plane saw. So we're looking at material that's coming out of the log that's plane saw. It's not quarter saw. Remember, quarter saw as we talked in the earlier problem, it's gonna have more of this type of thing. Look at Well, when we look at plane sawn and just look at the pictures, right? I'm gonna go back to the plane sawn photo here on page 87. And I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna pull out uh, a couple pieces here. I'm gonna pull out a flat piece that's kind of towards the center. And then I'm gonna pull out kind of a longer piece and that's consistent to what I see on figure 5.2. I see those pieces that are laying flat, right? So I'm seeing these kind of flat pieces here. And then I see these couple of these longer looking pieces that are part of the frame. Okay, that's great. And the X tells us that they're a section, but now they're plain sawn. So when I look at the plain sawn cut illustration on page 87 of the log, I'm gonna pick one off of the edge of that plane saw. And then I'm gonna pick, uh, the one on the edge of the plane saw is gonna be this type of figure. And then in this type of figure, it's gonna be more towards the center of the plane saw. And this is gonna be more towards the edge of the plane saw. So that's great. Okay, so then I'm gonna take out this X because it's it's just telling me that it's a nominal two by material, more or less, in that type of depiction. And then I'm going to draw in what I think is going to be the, the grain, right? What's the grain going to be looking like? And so on my plane saw on page 87, looking at towards the edge of that particular log, it looks something like this. something like that. And then on the other one, maybe something like this. I don't know, something like that. As I look at the two edges, but then when I look at the flat piece on the plane saw, it looks, you know, something like this. And so just looking at the, the rings or how it's cut out of the log tells us a little bit about what we might expect in terms of the, the performance or the shrinkage of the material. You know, here in front of me, if you're looking in the video, right? Here, I'm looking at this particular cut. It'd be something similar to that. And when I look at the grain here, I don't know, I'll try and hold it up close if you can see it, see here. The grain is kind of like this one right here that I, I kind of wrote in. I don't know if you can see the grain on that. But if you see the grain, the grain here is kind of, kind of an upside down U and this is kind of a very soft upside down U. Anyway, that's the idea is to you know, get an idea of where is it cut out of the log. Now, going back to the, the problem and looking at where these pieces are located within our platform framing, question asked, assuming that the plane saw framing lumber shrinks across its grain, 
at a rate that is the average of the shrinkage rates of tangential and radial shrinkage, how much will the roof drop if the lumber is installed at 19% moisture content and eventually dries at 15% moisture content? So we have to use that table again to get our data to do similar calculations that we did earlier. Now, when it says that the plain saw framing lumber shrinks across its grain, right? Across the grain, right? It's gonna shrink across the grain. So these materials are gonna shrink across the grain. These materials are gonna shrink as well across the grain. I mean, it's not as obvious shrinking here across the grain, right? This material is gonna shrink. Here it's gonna shrink, it's a different cut. So it's not gonna be maybe as pronounced here at a, at a level that it might be here, but it still is going to shrink. This is going to be more shrinkage in the radial direction. This is gonna be more shrinkage in what they call tangential. Tangential is gonna be as it tends, as it is a tangent for those of you who are math wizards, tangent to a circle is like, if this is the circle, this is tangent to the circle, right? So it's gonna be shrinking in this direction. If it's radial, it's gonna be shrinking in this direction, right? So now we're shrinking, you know, in the radial direction. So radial is gonna be like that. Tangential is gonna be on the edge of what is the grain itself. So that's a math thing, don't worry about it. Some of you, great. For some of you, don't worry about it if you didn't understand that. The idea is here is that they're not asking for one or the other, they're asking for the average. So when you look at that table, it gives you that during that framing of that section of the platform frame on page 153, figure 5.2, when they framed that originally, the moisture content was 19%. So then you have to go to the table and find 19, which is of course between 18 and 19. And then rise up and see the shrinkage at, of where they were at 19. So at 19, the radius, the radial curve says what? At 19%. Looks like it's about a little bit over one. So just, you know, 1.3. Okay. And what is it at the tangential? A little bit more, right? Maybe 1.3, 1.6. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you're, I mean, the estimate's fine. Give or less a point, that's no big deal. Then from 19%, what does the problem say? It shrunk to 15. 15. So now we go over to 15, do the same exercise. Okay, so is there a, uh, so from what the moisture content at 19% and then down to 15%, what's the difference between the radial and the tangential? So if the moisture content and the, and the shrinkage was at 1.3% and then at Both of them seem like they're about the same like 1.1 1 1.2 1 uh, percent as far happens? as i can tell for, for the change yeah for the change because you're going from 19 percent to 15 but you're getting i my, my understanding is that we're getting a couple of values one is we're getting the average right you're so you're right be by one one and a half percent because you're getting the average of the tangential and the radial You're getting the average of the tangential and the radial. Hold on, I admit people. Um, so Leilani, you said 1.3, 1.6, so 1.5, mm -hmm. right, right in the center. Mm -hmm. And then 15%. Uh, You're going up two and about 2.6. So say 2.3. So 1.5, 2.3, the difference is 0 0.8%, 0 0.8 or something like that, I think. Um, and so with that change, and when you're at 15% from 19%, I, 
I think we're really just focused on the 15% and then that average. What did we say the average was? 0.8, one, just call it one, because just, just call it one just because it's just easier to work with 1%. So that would be the change. So in the question that asks, assuming the plane self-frame lower shrinks across its grain at a rate that is average of the shrinkage of both the tangential and the radial, how much will the roof drop if the number is installed at 90% and then the content eventually dries to 15%, okay? So how much will it drop? Well, it start at 33 inches. So what is 1% of 33 inches? Right, 0 0.01 times 33. So 0.33 inches. So 0.33 inches, like five sixteenths of an inch. Are you guys getting this? Yeah, the well, well, color? when you take so when you take because inches are made of eighths, and then an inch is made of sixteenths, right? When you look at a ruler, you see it's divided by sixteenths, sixteenth equal parts, and then sixteenth equal parts are equal to, and then eighth equal parts, eight and a quarter, right? We go quarter to an eighth to sixteenth. So when you look at a ruler, right? When you look at a ruler and look at one inch, one inch is broken down into quarter inches. Yeah. Quarter inches, half what's half of a quarter inch, one eighth. And what's what's half of one eighth? One sixteenth. So in one inch, in one inch, right? This is one inch. One inch, there's half an inch. Now there's quarters, right? So there's one quarter, there's half an inch three quarters, one inch. So then in the quarters, you've got eighths. So there's one eighth, two eighths, three eighths, four eighths, five eighths, six eighths, seven eighths, eight eighths, one, one inch, right? And then sixteenths are one half of that. Right? One sixteen, two sixteen, three sixteen, four, five sixteen, sixteen, seven sixteen, eight sixteen, right? Yes. So if we have 0 0.3, inches, right? You can, if you multiply that by eight, you get eight. So 0.3 times eight is 2.4. So call it a quarter, a little over a quarter or three eighths. You know, it's approximate, but if you go 0 0.3 inches and you times it by 16, It'd be 4.8, call it 5 sixteenths, but it's but sixteenth, right? It's a sixteenth. So it's basically 0 0.30 inches times 16, right? Or 0.3, I shouldn't say it's not inches, it's percent, it's a percent. 0.03% times eight. Am I doing that right, you guys? I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing that right. So it sounds to me like the answer to the question would be it drops five sixteenths of an inch. Five sixteenths. And we got five sixteenths of an inch because I took the 33 inches is what we have total. We have total, it's, that's what the problem tells us, 33 inches. And we figured out one, we, we estimated a drop based on the table with rough numbers. We said 1% from 90% moisture content to 50% moisture content, that that 33 inches shrunk 1%. And so 1% of 33, as I just said, 33 times 0 0.01, which is 1%, mm -hmm. and I get 0 0.33. Got it. It's coming back. Okay. A little bit. Right. You got it. You got yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's right. It's so there. so we ended up figuring that out to be five sixteenths, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean five point says five point two eight my copy, but it'd be like um
1% change in moisture content. So 1% is equal to 0 0.01. So we took the 33 inches because the problem states that there's a total of 33 inches cross grain. So whenever you look at that picture and you see those X's in that platform frame on page 153, figure 5.2, right? We erased the X's, but we, because it was plain sawn, we drew in the grain based on our observation of what's plain saw and where we most likely believe that the material was cut from the what, what page and figure was that you're talking about? Page 89, figure 3.12. Oh, okay, it's okay. I'm there. That's that's the radius of the tangential table. The other table or the other diagram you need to be looking at is uh, in chapter five, figure 5.2, where it talks about platform frame, platform framing. And don't get caught up in the detail. All I want you to be looking at is the material where you see the cross hatch with an X. That's a section of what is a nominal two by material. So each X represents each, each of the X is going up this right. way. So the, it's gonna be a five sixteenth that needs to be separate. Right, so all of them together that you see, oh, all okay. of because it's one big platform frame, oh, okay. it's one huge assembly. Okay, and so all those X is added up equal 33 inches. Okay, perfect. So we look at it as a, compl a complete assembly, not just one individual piece. And so what they're saying is because we're using natural wood out of the log, and it's got a moisture content of 90% when we first built it, then you know a few weeks go by during the summer, all that moisture, like I was saying earlier, the sponge, all that moisture has been sucked out of that material, which means it shrinks. And so we lose, would we say we lose five sixteenths of an inch? Now we don't see that, no. and there's not going to be any real big change in, in the structure. But based on the table and our analysis, we can estimate a, a, a change of, of five sixteenths, where that wood material has shrunk, or the shrinkage of that material has brought that building down five sixteenths of an inch, based on the question and the analysis. Does that make sense, everybody out there in Zoom land? The, the key really is a lot of different keys, particularly it's hard for people who where this is new, where we're learning to read plans, where we're learning to understand a little bit about the structures. And, and so it's gonna take some time. So be patient with yourself and you know, watch this video over again. And if you can decode all the stuff I've been writing up here, maybe slow it down a little bit, that might be helpful. Um, but there's a lot of going and moving about in the textbook. And one in particular is the table on page 89, figure 3.12. We read that table. That gives us the, the change um, of, in the moisture content, right? And then also then the figure in the textbook of uh, 5.2, which is the later chapter that we haven't got to yet, but we're gonna get here, get to it very shortly, where it speaks to on the left side, it's not the balloon framing. I think the right side is the balloon frame. We don't worry about the balloon framing, but on the left side um, is the platform frame. And so that's um, what we're looking at. You could do the same calculation, make one up using the balloon frame. Because if you look at the balloon frame on the right, you do see a couple of section cuts of material similar to what we see here in the balloon frame. And you know you can take the problem that the workbook gives you switch around the numbers and do the calculation, see what happens, right? It's all the same processing. It's just different numbers. The last part says on the two by 12, right? So I'm gonna add a little more information to the problem. So these are two by 12s, right? These that are kind of upright sitting in this direction, we're, we're calling them two by 12. So a nominal two by 12 means that they're a half inch wide. I'm saying 1.5 inches or one and one half inches. And a two by 12 uh, nominally is not 12 inches. It's actually 11.25 inches. 0.25 means 11 and one quarter inch. Okay. So if we, this is key to understand. 
that that's 11 and a quarter inch. Because if you look at the question, it says, assuming that the two by 12 wood floor joists of both floor levels are replaced with laminated veneer lumber joists with negligible shrinkage. Now, looking at the text, negligible means that it's a material that doesn't shrink. And a material that doesn't shrink means it most likely then was man produced, right? It was a, it's an engineered product, probably made of glue and other things that don't allow it to shrink. So when we read that the laminated veneer lumber joists with negligible shrinkage means they don't shrink. Mm -hmm. So how much will the roof drop under the same change in moisture conditions now? So we based off of the 19th. Well, you've got this and how, where do you, how many places do you see this two by 12? in your platform frame. If you look at the platform frame on page 153, figure 5.2, how many times do you see kind of this long two by 12 in a section cut within the frame? Look at it again, count, count them, right? You see the flat two by, but then you see the long two by, kind of the vertical long two by. You'll see it twice. You see it twice, right? You do, you see it twice. You see it at the floor. Yeah. You, see it, you see it at the floor, how it's, how it's much more taller and vertical than the flat pieces, right? That's what we're seeing here. They're two by 12 and you see this is their actual depth. And you have how many? You have two of them. So 11.25 or 11 and a quarter times two, what is that value? Because you I know you're going to get to it eventually. Say again? I, I know you're going to get to it eventually, but I got the answer to the question as 0. 0.1125 okay. inches total. Okay. Um, we'll get there. Thank you for sharing. We'll, we'll verify that. So we, had, we started off with 33 inches in part A, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're removing these natural products. And we're moving these, and now these are going to be used. We're going to use an engineered product that has been manufactured. It doesn't shrink, but it's got to be the same value as what was the natural product, which is 11 and a quarter. So 11 and a quarter times two is what? 11 and a half. It's 22 and a half, mm -hmm. right? So 22 and a half. So now you've removed 22 and a half inches from the original problem. Remember, the original problem was 33. Well, we just removed. 22 and a half inches from that 33 with a product that doesn't shrink. Mm -hmm. So what is 33 less 22 and a half? Uh -huh. Okay, now, now we do the same calculation, right? Instead of 33 inches, we have, what did we say, 10? 10, 10 and a half? Mm -hmm. We do the same calculation. What is the shrinkage of 10 and a half times 0 0.01? Is, and is that what you, is that how you got your solution? I, I just basically um, got the, the equation for the, the uh, two by 12 and then subtracted that from the original. That's it. And then, and then you have your 1% moisture reduction or reduction or the, the moisture shrunk the material, but now minus the two by 12s. So, so you're gonna do 10 and a half times the 1%. So you do 10 and a half, right? On the, this is part A mm -hmm. and then part B is- We're gonna change that. Because how did we get 10 and a half? Well, we, had, we originally had 33 inches, but now these two by 12s, aren't two by 12s anymore. They're an engineered laminated veneer product, man-made. So they're, but we have to keep the same value of the two by 12. And in fact, in the industry, they manufacture products that replace the natural product of the two by 12 with these veneer products. And they're the same depth of 11 and a half, 11 and a quarter. They have to be because they're replacing something that's natural. And they do that because they're eliminating shrinkage, right? The risk of the building shrinking. And so in this case, when uh, Leilana did the calculations of 33 inches, we subtracted 11 and a quarter, but there's two of them. There's two, one, two, 
When we look at the platform frame, we see two of them. So we multiply twice to get 22 and a half. 33 less 22 and a half ends up being, did you say 10.5, 10 and a half? Yeah, 10.5. So now we're doing 10.5 inches because we eliminated the two two by 12s with veneer laminated lumber, which doesn't shrink. So now we just have 10 and a half inches and we multiply it that by 0.01. Zero point zero one. So 0 0.105, so 0 0.105. 0.105. So 0 0.105 is what you got, right? Yeah. And then um, that is going to be the change within that 10 and a half inches. So 0 0.105 is, call it, call it a quarter inch. Well, I get 1.6 over 16, call it 2 16th, call it one quarter. Right, 2 16ths is a quarter. But I got 1.6. I mean, if you want to, you know, we don't need to go to 30 seconds. That's ridiculous, but we're, we're roughing it. So I would say I got my calculator 1.7. I'm going to uh, estimate and take the higher. And that's going to be 2.0. So I go from 1.6 to 2.0. So I have two sixteenths of an inch. It's really one quarter of an inch because I'm going to go lowest common denominator. 16 divided by four is four. Right, two or two divided an eighth of an inch. I'm sorry, not quarter, an eighth. I'm sorry. So this ends up being, would you say, zero point one oh five, right? Mm -hmm. And so zero point one oh five, and because there's sixteenths mm -hmm. uh, within one inch, I'm I times it by sixteen. Gotcha. You got one point six eight, and then I get one point six eight. I'm gonna approximately one point six eight, which I'm gonna take up to 2.0, right, or two. So 1.68 becomes two, two sixteenths well, is equal to one eighth, approximately. So the 10 inches with the shrinkage without the 33 inches now is it, it, it shrunk an eighth of an inch. Oh, that's a lot of work. Yeah, that's a lot of And really the part A, doing part A and then just really uh, uh, subtracting 11 and a quarter where you see the two kind of vertical pieces here that are part of the platform frame mm -hmm. or long kind of elongated tall vertical pieces. Subtracting that from the 33 gets you, gets you the new uh, natural product that's impacted by the moisture. And as you do the same calculations, uh, you're seeing then what, what is the change therein with uh, with this material only, which is the uh, the two by that's laid more on the flat side as a as opposed to um, more vertical. Okay. All right. So that's three point one three two. Probably longer than I want to talk about. Uh, let's take a break. I'm going to put the recording on um, pause. All right, so real quick, what I'm gonna be doing, so be patient with me here, because um, I'm gonna go slow, but I want you to maybe take, take note of a few things, because I might have to have you go uh, to the dollar store and pick up some scalable pieces and parts that I want you to play around with and concoct for me at home. And uh, here in the classroom, you guys can pick up some stuff here that I have. Uh, but uh, I'll go through of the type of crafty materials that I want you to pick up at the dollar store at Fred Meyer or wherever it might be and have you do uh, give you some work to do uh, between now and over the course of the next two to three weeks as it relates to our study of the wood materials. But what I wanted to review real quick, we kind of did this earlier is we talked about wood products, and the two by material, the nominal material, two by fours, two by six. Uh, those types of uh, parts and pieces of the lumber that we use to frame buildings, right? Wood is a predominant product that we utilize to a great extent to frame buildings. And with that being said, the two by the four by, they're natural products. As you recall, when you looked at, I can't remember the pages, but when you looked at the log and how we looked and quartered out a product, natural product out of the, out of the log with the quarter sawn, with the plane sawn, 
it's really important to see where the grains uh, align with those products and really how they're implicated in the construction of a building, which we've been having some great conversations about tonight. I really like it a lot. Now, with that being said, because you know we're humans and we are innovative and we're creative and as it ties into our studies in construction 101 in the first few chapters we read about technology and how we advance in technology and construction well as we saw over history we advance a great deal uh, in technology not just when we say technology it's all about the computer and software and those types of tools but technology can be technology where we take wood and we create really cool products with wood. And I know it's down here low on the screen, but what I like to call engineered wood products. That is somebody had to think about and engineer out of wood, these really cool products. Now I mentioned it earlier in the, in the, in the discussion of that assignment where we switched out the two by 12s with a laminated veneer product. And a lot of those laminated veneer products, as I was sharing with you are, you know, essentially laminated. You know, these are just small strips of, of wood that are compressed together with glue. No, we're not gonna get to make this too complicated. A really super strong glue that then, you know, squish everything together to create a product that's not natural, it's manufactured, right? So all this goes through some manufacturing process to create a very strong structural wood. And so that would be used in place of the natural wood. So that's, Kind of what that would be, and I called it a, um, a laminated, they call it a laminated veneer product. Um, and that comes in all sizes that are equivalent to what are the nominal pieces. So the two by four, the four by four, we can create equivalent products using laminated veneer product. So engineered wood products, uh, I mentioned um, laminated veneer products, there's plywood, right? We talked about plywood. Um, Right, the plywood with the plies. Here's a one, two, three, four ply. This is probably a, you know, a CDX and you can get more details in your textbook talking about different types of plywood. But this is a, a, a plywood as we spoke about last week or a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Matt here, one of our students here in the classroom said it's, you know, essentially you create plywood. You think about when you're sharpening your pencil with a little hand pencil sharpener twist that pencil through there, you kind of get that sheath of wood that comes off as you're sharpening the pencil. That's an example of what's going on on a large scale when they create plywood is that they, you know, like corn the cob, you kind of put two ends to the corn, the cob, and you, as you eat it, you kind of twist it and you're kind of taking off the surface, but just the skin of the surface and creating a very small ply that will be cut up and create in plies to create, well, plywood. So plywood actually is an engineered wood product. Someone figured out about plywood and it's been around for many, many, many years. There's the eye joist. I spoke to you about the eye joist, right? Engineered wood product. And notice that this, this piece here in the center is called the web, WB. This part's called the flange. This part's called the web. The web looks like it's like a bunch of little wood wafers. Well, wafer board or what we call oriented strand board. Again, really up close there in the picture, if you see it, it's, it's not ply. It's glue and a mash and meat pieces of wood. And it's all compressed through a manufacturing process. Someone's engineered this to be equal to plywood. And it's an economical product. Uh, it comes called OSB in the stores, oriented strand boards, what they call it. And it's equivalent to plywood and used uh, in place of plywood on many occasions. And then these parts up here, as you can see, can be laminated or they can be regular wood. Right? So you have a natural part, a natural uh, a piece of wood in combination with an engineered wood product to create this kind of eye look, eye joist, which is, as we'll study later in the spring, this kind of shape is great uh, for structures. It creates a great uh, structural strength of the building. And we'll talk about that. But in this case, you can kind of see a combination of this engineered wood product that's uh, kind of cool. And something that is often used in construction. So that's the eye joist. Um, the glue lamb, the glue lamb, I talked to you a little bit about that last week. It's kind of the same as the laminated veneer product at a smaller scale here. Glue lamb is much larger scale. These are essentially two buys, right? These are like two buys all stacked on one top of the other. 
and again, compressed with a very, very complex glue manufactured product. This can be a very nice detail. Sometimes if you go into a nice, let's say church or a nice uh, public facility where they want big open ceilings and open spaces, they'll use glue laminated beams because they can finish, they look really nice and they're, they're a little bit expensive, but you can customize them to create this natural, uh, not natural, but this uh, pre-engineered wood product. And so that's the glue lamp. And then the big thing that recently that they uh, have been talking about is called CLT or cross laminated timber. And it's all this kind of same idea of plies or laminations or veneers of, of thin strips of wood or two by material stacked one on top of the other compressed together with a really strong glue and then utilized in structures, utilized in different parts of the building in terms of holding the building up or supporting the structure or sometimes just as a finish piece. They look really, really nice. So I wanted to go over, I'm gonna go over to the table and kind of give you an idea at scale what I want you to be doing uh, these next few weeks and have some fun at home because you can actually yourself with the scale of what we can do at home with our little crafty hands and kits, we can actually create these products. I'm gonna show you how, all right? So I'm gonna go right now and move over to the other, uh, I'm gonna unpin here, remove the pin, and I'm gonna go over here and I'm going to make it, pin this. So everyone should see, hopefully, uh, the, um, the textbook there in their uh, picture and um, in there, let's see. In there is the, um, I just wanted to show you real quick here, the textbook, this is page 89 of your textbook. Here's that table we've been talking about the first half of the class, figure 3.12. It's kind of hard to, to see that. Maybe I can get that a little bit closer. Yeah, 3.12, kind of put this in view here. Um, this is the table that gets you the uh, moisture content. Uh, and again, figure 3.12, go back and watch the video from tonight to see how, uh, we kind of talked this through and uh, what you're using is you're using the moisture content down here. Here's your shrinkage factor, which is the y-axis here. And you've got tangential line and you've got the radial line here. And so it's basically just kind of coming up and doing some rough estimates as to what these values are. Okay. The other quick page that I was looking at were, was this page where you can see the plane sawn and the quarter uh, sawn and how the interest of the grain is relative to the cut. And so you can see that the quarter sawn, that the cut is more of, you know, a parallel to the top and bottom. It's not this direction, but it's more in line in um, uh, tangential, if you will, to the top and bottom. Whereas when you come to the quarter sawn, you can see here, it, in, in like this piece of here, it's it's more of, you know, the curvature may be more in line or going elongated, right, along the, the top and the bottom as opposed to uh, being more, um, I guess, uh, would be uh, uh, an, of a 90 degree angle here more so than these are a little bit more softer. Anyway, idea is just to kind of get an idea of where they are in the planes on the course on. So I, that's kind of why I wanted to you to kind of refresh and go back to those pages. Here's a nice, here's a nice depiction down here. I just wanted to show you um, uh, on 3.14, which is right here. So I can reach over and you guys can see that a little bit better. This is this is nice here. Uh, kind of gives you an idea of what's going on and where some of the cuts are here and how with due to the moisture content, and here it talks about tangential and radial, how with the moisture content these pieces will, will shrink, right? You can see kind of how they will shrink and they kind of have an outline that when the moisture leaves, these uh, raw pieces of natural wood coming out of the lumber, uh, when it goes into place, as we were talking about earlier in the class, as the moisture leaves it, the moisture content allows it to shrink. And uh, I use my little example about the sponge, but that's uh, you know exaggerated to kind of give you an idea that literally these are full of water, but as they, uh, as the water leaves, as you squeeze the sponge, so to speak, the uh, sponge or the material shrinks and it has an impact on construction. All right, so I just wanted to review that real quick here in the text. 
Um, here's what we looked at earlier was this um, platform frame. Let me pull back so you can see that. I know that the acuity and the clarity of this is not good, but you can see this is the platform frame and these are the features that I wanted you to look at. And these uh, items that you see with the X, that you see the X of these items, all of these add up to that 33 inches that we were talking about earlier uh, tonight. So this is a, a great exercise uh, in that workbook, part A and B. And again, it's a tough one. So you know, get, do your best to try and understand it and complete it to the best of your ability. And that's all I'm looking for, is to have you do your best to try and understand it. Because um, it'll get there, you'll get it. I'm not too worried about that. But do, do that assignment, do your best. All right, so that being said, let's get to some fun things. All right. So I, uh, I think last week or a couple weeks ago, I showed you a few things that I had some fun during the summer because I was trying to figure out how I could make this class interesting, make it fun. And well, I thought about wood products and how at home uh, to scale, right? I wouldn't expect you to build a 40 foot long um, a laminated you know, beam, glue laminated beam, that's impossible, right? There's no way, that's ridiculous. But you could do something on scale at home. And so here, I, if you look at this, I kind of created my own little laminated beam. Um, as I was talking to you last week, uh, I just used Elmer's glue. And looking it up here closely, uh, how, how many uh, layers of two by material do I have? I have one, two, three, four, five. So you can see there's five layers on top of each other. I glued them together. And uh, how I did it, was I took a clothespin, right? And it's a little bit messy, but use Elmer's because it'll wash off and it doesn't stink and it's non-toxic. And if you want to get your kids involved, that would you know, make it fun. But you can see here, what I did is I took a um, clothespin, maybe you want to get a bigger one, and just um, went, you know, when I was gluing and putting everything together, it went something like this. Um, and then let it go set overnight. You know, and you, I used three just to make sure there was an even, if you will, even count on how that was done. Uh, but yeah, you know, so this isn't rocket science, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the routine of how I did it so you can get an idea of what I'm looking for. Because I, guess what? I'm asking you to build and create your own glue lamb bean, all right? So how do we do that? Well, I'll show you. And I, I, I qualify everything that you do at home to be very, very safe because you will be using a sharp object. That sharp object is called, -da, it's called the scissors, right? Hopefully everyone's been trained on how to use scissors. Um, try, if you have at home, a, a pretty awesome scissors uh, that they're really strong because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking what looks to be here to be a popsicle stick, right? And you're going to be uh, measuring it and cutting it. Now I'll show you how I did it and you might find a better way to get a better cut, but um, that's that, that, those are the things that you need kind of up front, right, right, right at the moment. So products that I, that I uh, went out to, to pick up, whether it's at the $1 store or Fred Myers or even Michaels has, I think, these items. If you have a Michaels nearby where you're at, I don't believe that they cost a great deal, but I think it's a good investment because the plan is to do a lot more of these type of activities at home because certainly uh, we can't go at the job site and play around with them, but we can do it at home. And quite frankly, what we do at home and how we talk about it and how we put it together at home really isn't gonna be a lot different than thinking about it and how it's done out actually out in the field. Um, so here are some things that you might wanna look at. Uh, creatology, uh, these are craft dowels. And so you get a lot of different shapes and sizes uh, with this product. So I'm just showing you these things so you can make a note of it. Here's uh, another creatology of wood sticks. Now these wood sticks, if you look, are different size than these and that's that's there's a reason behind that because then we're looking at what essentially to scale is uh two by uh, six material to scale this is probably a two by eight or two by ten we'll check that out later and it's important because 
we want to have our products built to scale so they are realistic um, and give you a kind of a sense of their size and um, and how they relate and, and how you would relate to them in a larger scale. So those things are going on there. Um, here's another uh, different product called Simply Art. Again, it's these I think look almost like um, coffee stir sticks that you'd see if you went to Starbucks and got a coffee and you're stirring it, you're stirring the cream and sugar into it. But this is an arts and crafts deal. So you can see here um, what, what that's all about. Come up, some other things. You got all these at the uh, dollar store? Pretty much, yeah. Dollar store, Fred Meyers, any variety store. Michael's has some pretty cool stuff. This is, um, this is I think, a Fred Meyer I got. Again, these are just um, uh, popsicle sticks, but they're different colors. And um, I haven't thought of the lesson plan yet, but I know that I can create something with the different colors and really illuminate uh, something of importance related to our studies. So this is always a nice investment. And I believe they're, again, in the arts and crafts section of, I think I got these at Fred Myers. Um, anything else? No, I, you know, there's some other things that you might want to get that you might have an interest in. Uh, here is what would be not something that's square edge, but more of a circular nature. It, a dowel is what they I think they call them. But if you, you know, cut these or work with them in a way, we might be able to craft a model, uh, whether it be a small model with columns or you know, these could emulate a product that might be a feature and a detail that we're looking to, to build and manufacture uh, at home to scale. Um, so the dowels, this is kind of nice to have. We'll probably work with these. And let's see, um, the only other thing I, have here in my bag of tricks when I was out uh, moseying around for fun stuff is this thing, they look like toothpicks, but they're, they're again, they're dowels, but they're really tiny dowels. And, you know, one thing that I could see us working with on this uh, would be, um, you know, perhaps figuring out how we might be able to, in, in, in lieu of being able to work with steel, right, we might be able to figure out how this could be a piece of rebar and how we might be able to connect or use rebar in the generation, let's say, of how we build a footing or something like that. Um, so this is a nice, a nice little crafty thing to have as well. So I'll uh, be looking out for this. And that's pretty much what's on my table. Uh, other thing, when you get to Fred Myers, when you get to the arts and crafts and things, you're going to see uh, clay. And I would say grab some clay, not the play dough. But I think there's some stuff that's a little bit more um, sophisticated clay. It looks something like this. And we certainly uh, were able to be able to sculpt, if you will, or form what might be a detail. Uh, I know recently, I think uh, last week, I, I pulled out the clay to generate what might be a footing or a foundation. And there'll be a lot of places where we might be able to use this and be able to kind of craft something that's uh, to scale that might be fun. So go ahead and grab some clay and you'll have it. And I'm certainly going to be able to find some good use of it. Okay. So with all that being said, and I shared with you, um, you know, go out and get some arts and craftsy things. Let's, uh, let's build a glue lamb bean. And so you have some choices here with your glue lamb bean. I, I showed you earlier what I had built. Um, and if I were to take this and take the scale, and the scale that I'm using, the scale that I want you to use at home, is the uh, scale here, which is the half inch, okay? So here's our half inch scale. And uh, yeah, I think it's half inch. If not, I may have made a mistake, but if I take my Goulin beam that I made and I wanna scale it here, um, this is, I believe, to scale, if I hold it up to my scale here, this is, I don't know if you can see that down there, I'll see if I can get it closer up there. You guys can see that okay. Um, this is, looks like, uh, I can't, I'm trying to get it so you can see it. This looks to be how wide? It looks to be about, can you guys see that? Let me see if I can bring it up a little closer here. Okay. What is it? it? Looks to be about, what, six? Looks to be about eight inches. You guys agree? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, is it what do you on a scale? What do you think it is? It's half inches. 
one foot. So how many inches eight. is it wide? How many inches wide is that, do you think? Eight. Yeah, eight? It, looks, it looks like eight. Okay, so we'll go with eight inches, but we're gonna go one better. Um, it's eight inches wide here. And for, for our purposes and for our learning, this is going to be, this piece here is going to be a two, um, it's seven and a quarter inches in, in reality, but that is eight inches, it's gonna be a two by eight. Okay, so this distance from here to here in real life, for a two by eight, this is gonna be seven and one quarter inches. We're pretty close when we measured it, it's eight inches. So we're gonna call it seven and a quarter just because we wanna uh, pretend and, and we are pretty close to scale there. Okay, that being said, what is our depth? Now, I'm not gonna use the half inch scale for depth because it's not gonna be accurate. I want us to be thinking in terms of reality. So if I have here one, two, three, four, five. I have five two by eight stacked on top of each other. What is my depth gonna be based on our studies? How deep is a two by eight? I should say how deep, but how wide is a typical two by eight? If you know the width of a two by eight, and I've got five of them, you're gonna multiply this by five to get its depth. See ya. What is the width of a two by eight? We know it's seven and a quarter wide. So what is this depth? It's an inch and a half. Right, the depth is an inch and a half. So if I have five two by eights that are one and one half inches, what is my depth? It's gonna be five times an inch and a half. So one is inch and a half, two is three inches, three is four and a half inches, four is gonna be six inches. One more seven and a half. Seven and a half inch depth. So my depth is seven and a half inches here. My width is seven and a quarter. So my glue lamb is going to be a uh, seven and a quarter by, what did we say? Uh, what was this again? Seven, se six and a half? Seven and a half. No, seven and a half. Seven and a half. Right, so seven and a quarter. So seven and a quarter by seven and a half glue lamb. So how you would write that, um, I don't have scratch paper paper with me here. How you would write that would be something like, like this, it would be seven and one half inch inches by seven and one quarter inch, something like that. That would be the shape of this. Now, what is my length? Well, let's get our uh, half inch equals one foot. See here, I'll get you down here closer, right there. Let's see. What is my what is my length of my glue lamb beam? Eight feet. Eight feet, right? It's eight feet. Right? It's eight foot on the money. So my glue lamb beam. Seven and a half by seven and a quarter at eight foot length. Okay. So that's, and then I got some sander and that they're glued. I sanded it up and, and made it look nice and pretty. And actually, I, I'm thinking about even getting some, you know, old stain that I have sitting in the cabinet someplace at home and just kind of putting it on it and see what, see how it takes it. Probably gonna look pretty cool. Um, this is what I want you guys to do. I want you to build a glue lamb beam. So let's do that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get those fun, fun colors. So here I have some fun colors. Uh, let's see, I got, I got a, there's a purple one there. It's my purple, 
Get a red one and a yellow one. Yellow one and a red one. So here have all some really fun colors. We're gonna make a glue lamb. Certainly these colors will be stacked on top of each other. We're gonna go half an inch, right? Half an inch and what size we wanna go. Well, I don't wanna make my glue lamb with this rounded edge. So I've gotta square it off. I've gotta square this off. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a template here. I'm half inch equals one foot. So as I measure this up, if you guys can see that, okay, I'm gonna take my pencil. And so there's, I'm gonna put, and you can just, you don't have to be perfect, but just here's my zero right there. And then um, here's my eight foot right there. So we're gonna make it eight foot long. So here's where I want you to be careful. So I take my scissors and with great carefulness here, I just, you know, I try to, I cut it like this. I just kind of line it up the best I can and kind of cut it like that, okay? So you got to find a pretty good scissors that's going to do that. And then this end, I'm going to do the same. Find my line here. And I'm just going to cut it like that. So now I have, I'll double check here, my measure. Where's my half inch? There's my half inch. So my half inch, and I'm gonna check to make sure it's still eight foot. And that's pretty close to still being eight foot. It doesn't have to be perfect. But there's my template, right? I'm right at eight foot. Oops, let me get you, I'm off the camera here. There. So right at eight foot. Now I wanna do the rest of these. I want to do the rest of these up here. And so I'm just going to use the template. I don't need to bring my, my ruler back in here, but I'm just going to kind of line this up here like this. All right, good night, Jeff. Night, and do that. And I'm going to do that for the rest of them. I'm just going to cut them. And I'm finding that these colorful uh, sticks they're pretty easy to cut with scissors but still find a pretty good scissors and so there's my first lamination of my glue lamb beam right there um bring the red one up here And the, the pieces that you cut, they're gonna go flying off. So make sure you don't upset people at home because they're gonna find these little bits and pieces. So you, you'll have to probably go out and, and pick them up. Um, and so I'll do one more because I know you guys have the ID here and I'll, 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 glue, I'll glue them. And it, it's messy, but it's effective to do what we want to try and accomplish here. Now remember, you're not looking for perfection. What you're looking for is your eight foot glue lamb beam. Now in this case, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put the piece aside and I'm gonna take one of these because I just wanna verify with my half inch scale that I'm working with a, looks like I'm working with I don't know if you guys can see that. Oops, hold on. Let me get to where you can see it. I'm working with, looks like what? Uh, nine inches, is that right? It's like about nine inches. Yeah. You guys agree, nine inches? So we could call it nine and a quarter, and nine and a quarter is a two by two. So the actual depth here, the actual depth of a two by 10 is nine and a quarter. So from here to here, it's nine and a quarter inch. This is the two by 10. The thickness is an inch and a half. Now it's probably just almost looks like it's maybe thicker than that to scale, but the thickness is gonna be an inch and a half, all right? So in this case, now we've got our four pieces for our glue lamb beam. 
We just need to stack them. And I'm just stacking them right now to get an idea. Now it's not perfect. You can see here, I didn't do a great job of cutting. I'm a little bit off, you can see here. So I might go back and make some adjustments. And uh, this orange one looks like it might be a little bit longer than eight foot, but I'll go back there and, and, and uh, ultimately I'll sand it. So it will kind of, kind of end up with a, a, re a regular uh, straight edge finish there. But now stacking it at such, and then getting your glue, right, can be a little bit messy. So in doing so, you just glue them together, right? And so certainly the ask is not that you're going to hold it together till it actually starts to glue. Um, the ask is, is this is where the clothespins come in place, right? And you want to make sure there's an even pressure on it. It looks pretty good. It looks kind of messy. Uh, but again, remember, you're going to be able to come back. This is Elmer's glue. You're going to be able to come back and sand this. Uh, whether you sand it by hand, I was able actually to get uh, on my drill, they have little bits that allow you to sand. That seemed to help me a lot. A lot. I'll bring that to class or I'll, I'll do that demonstration at home and show you how that looks. Um, and so you can see here, I'm not quite evened up at the end. Um, so there might be some adjustments that you need. And it looks like the colors are kind of, <laughs> again, if this isn't gonna be toxic because it's made for little kids. And so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, go overboard in the glue. Cause I'm thinking as I'm building this thing, that's probably what's going on in the plant when they're manufacturing these things. They're, they're probably going, going pretty heavy on the glue because it's the glue that has to keep it together. And many times these, elements of glue lamb beans, uh, when they're installed, they're in a structural capacity. So they better be made strong and ready for uh, use in a structural environment. Uh, many times glue lamb beans are going to be customized. So architects will you know, call on engineers to design and customize uh, the glue lamb bean and um, allow, you know, for, for the use that it's uh, being uh, um, accommodated for. And uh, so I, that's what I got. I'll pan back with my dirty hands here so you can kind of see, oops, hold on a second. See what I have there. Um, so what I've just done is I created a, a glue lamb bean right? A four, uh, two by 10, uh, stacked on top of each other, glued. And that'll set, and that'll be actually pretty solid overnight. Then when I remove the clothespins, I'll measure it up, should be around eight foot. I'll probably be long or short in some in instances. So I'll grab some sandpaper or when you're out grabbing some of these items that I shared with you tonight, grab some sandpaper and just start to sand it and smooth it out um, and make it start to look pretty. These pieces that we make now, um, idea here, of course, I want you to be thinking about engineered wood products, how they're built. I would like you to go to the textbook. Um, I don't have anything to wipe my hands here, but if you go to the textbook, I'm gonna step away from the screen for a second. You go to the textbook, um, I'm gonna find a page or pages to read up on the glue lamb bean. Um, hold on a second, I think I just skipped it there. 
It's on page 96. So if you go to page 96 of your textbook, you'll see a nice color picture of the blue lamb bean. Um, here it is right here. Uh, wood products, if you go to page 96, you can see it's a really nice looking uh, structural piece. And it talks a little bit about its construction there. Um, and so that's that's what I want you to do this week. So I want you to build your blue lamb beam. You can follow my my roll, make it eight foot, because that's about the length that you're going to be able to make it if you buy your crafting materials. Uh, and once you get it built, you'll be able to you know create something like this, where you'll be able to sand it, make it look real nice. And like I said, I'm going to find some stain to be able to make that nice. In this case, with uh, the different colors, it's obviously can't be stained, but I want you to keep in mind um, in doing a nice job of putting these together, because what we're going to do over time is as we build these little pieces and parts, we're actually going to build a model. Um, I'm working on a design, so these parts and pieces that we're making will actually build a model uh, to emulate, you know, a structure, a wood uh, a structure that um, should be fun to build at home and to be able to share and to at the same time learn and have some fun. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? It's pretty straightforward, you guys. Other than being messy, but again, it's not toxic. Just need to wash your hands. So do we build this for next week's assignment? And then do we, how do we show it to you? I guess if we're in zoom land, um, you, you have video, right? What was that? You have a video. Everyone has video features, right? Everyone has a video camera on their laptop, don't they? Or the oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so on your phone or your or your, it's probably easier on your phone, right? Um, because you can take the phone. I got like I've got the document camera that the school gave me, but you can take your phone, right? And you can I can pull it back, and you know you can do some cool things with your phone. Say here's you know here's me making my blue lamb beam, and then maybe come back and give us different shots and different angles of it, right? really kind of get into it and have some fun because this isn't going to be the last piece that you'll make. I'll have you do some other pieces and it's not just going to be glue lambs because glue lambs obviously are, are pretty straightforward and pretty easy to make. Um, there's some more complicated pieces that I'm going to have you work on, but we'll hold off on that because I just wanted to introduce you to the idea of being able to, you know, make models to scale with some of these wood, wood products that we've been talking about. So last week, I think I showed you this. And this piece here took some time to build. Same idea, it's all glued together. But this is what they call CLT, or cross-laminated timber. And if you go to your textbook, it actually will talk and tell you a little bit about cross-laminated timber. I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be on page 97. You'll see it in the bottom right-hand corner of page 97 of uh, cross-laminated timber. So here I have the textbook. You can see here, there's cross laminated timber right there in that picture. And there is a reading about it here. And I was actually able, if you look at this, I was actually able to make a piece of cross laminated timber, a component piece of cross laminated timber. So this is something that you can do as well. It'll take a little bit of time, but with everything that I've shared with you tonight, and with some sandpaper to make it look kind of pretty cool. Um, you know, we're gonna be able to take all these little artifacts that we're making at home and I'll give you instructions and you'll be able to create a really cool model that will speak to all the things that you're learning about wood structures and particularly wood materials as it relates to this class. All right, so go out and have some fun with this. And, and I, I hope that, um, that this was helpful and I hope you, as you do these things, um, think about you know, what you're building and, and um, what's, what's behind it all and maybe even reference your textbook to learn a little bit more, all right? Okay, well, I'm gonna go clean my hands and does anybody have any questions? So does this need to be done by next Wednesday, correct? Um, I mean, that's ideal and I'll, I'll set up it in the module as, as an assignment. Um, that's ideal. I'll establish a due date, you know, not next week, but, you know, in a couple of weeks, but I want, I want us to, you know, be able to build something of, of something that's small, but something that we can continue to kind of 
you know, cre uh, build, create, but then at some point I want us to take all that we've created and then, you know, generate a model based on all these cool things that we built. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I'm here for a few more minutes. So if you need some t more time to digest, uh, and, and that's fine. I'll, um, I'll be here to answer any questions. Just make shout out to me and I'll be in the room. Okay. Other than that, thanks for hanging out today. I know it was a long night. I know there's a long wait. Um, I'll, I, I'm working on the technology thing in the classroom. So sorry about that. Are you going to be on campus Saturday? Uh, good question. Um, the plan is right now, yes. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. You're welcome. If you want, <laughs> I would say if anybody wants to come in on Saturday, actually, I will come in on Saturday and we can, you know, we can build our glue lamb and maybe have fun and maybe build some other things and get crazy. So come on in on Saturday and we can, we can have some fun. You know what time you'll <clears throat> be open for Saturday? Yeah, I'm usually here about 9, 9.15, between the window of 9 and 9.15. Okay, perfect. Okay. I got a question for you real quick. Yeah. So I was course. looking at the uh, in-class assignment number three, working with wood. Yeah. Uh, the first, number one, that's pretty self-explanatory, section three, one, and three, two. But then you're talking about drawing a sketch. What sketch are you talking about? Okay, I have to pull up the Canvas assignment. Which assignment was it? It's not part of the workbook. It's a different one. No, I, I'm assuming so. It's uh, the in-class assignment number three, working with wood, uh -huh. 3.1 and 3.2. Number okay. one is for your homework, do the workbook pages. Number two is being neat and clean, clear with your illustration of with a sketch.